We are really honored to have today Al Hassan, who is a trainer and a project director at the uh, ATTC at UCLA as well. And he's going to be talking to us about heroin, prescription opioids, and HIV. So I'd like to welcome Al and uh, take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for the, uh, and, and uh, Tom, thanks for the lunch. You know, um, when, when we go out and we do trainings at, uh, at, at different organizations, usually there's, there's two responses that we get or two recommendations. One is to provide food, you know, and so uh, that was certainly one of them. The second one that we usually get most frequently is to, to be at the beach. And, and uh, while we're not at the beach, I think if you walk around out here, you really get a feel or a sense that you're not in the middle of Los Angeles. Um, so, but speaking of which, and uh, I don't know if you guys know, but the LA Historic Park just uh, had their grand reopening uh, over the course of the weekend. If you get an opportunity, it's uh, right along, it's between the LA River and the tracks. It's a really nice place to, uh, to spend some time if you get that opportunity. So with that, I want to thank you all for being here, and uh, this is going to be a whirlwind. So uh, I know that I put in way too much information. Phil and I went back and forth about it. He said I have too much information. And so if I talk a little fast, uh, it's because I have too much information. <laughs> so with that, uh, we're going to talk about heroin, prescription opioids, HIV, you know, we have a little bit about HCV in there. We, you know, and, and, and certainly there's a huge intersection between that and mental health and, and uh, a number of the other things that are going on. So with that, we're going to talk about, you know, what, what they are, what do they do, where do they come from, you know, really why we give a damn, you know, what difference, really what difference does it make. We're going to get into some of the epidemiology, who's using them and sort of what impact it has, really how we got where we are today. You know, and it's, it's kind of interesting. We'll, we'll hear from Nora Volkow, the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, as to how we got here, and then sort of what we can do about it. And there are, as, as Beth mentioned, you know, we haven't done so well with stimulants, with medications for the treatment of stimulant dependence, but we've done an incredibly good job of coming up with medications for the treatment of opioid disor disorder. And this started years and years ago. When I first started uh, in, in the field as an undergraduate at Cal State Northridge a while ago, um, uh, actually I had hair back then, believe it or not, but uh, it, we were evaluating medications, naltrexone for the treatment of opioid use disorder. That was one of the first trials that we, that, that we undertook, and that was, that was in 1977 uh, at the VA hospitals. So, with that, uh, we're going to test your knowledge a little bit, all right? So here we go. While opioids and opiates belong to the same family, they are derived by a, a, a different process. True or false? I think we should have music, don't you? You know, like <laughs> something playing along here. Okay, all right, we're gonna close it. All right, so 75% true, 25% false. That looks pretty good. Next question Opioids act as either A or AN, partial agonist, full agonist, an antagonist, or an agnostic <laughs> at the mu, kappa, and delta receptors. Okay, here we go. We're going to close this. So, okay, so 22%, that's nice. We got, we got a little variety there. 22% say a partial agonist. 33% say a full agonist. 45% said an antagonist. And Tom Freeze probably said an agnostic. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you, Tom. I like that. That's, I appreciate that. Okay. While the majority of the world's opium production is generated in Afghanistan, the majority of heroin coming into the United States comes from Mexico and South America. True or false? Nice, here we go. A few more people are playing. I like it. All right. So 75% say true and 25% false. And if you stick around to the end of the day, we'll actually get to find out which one it is. While persons who inject drugs account for a diminishing percentage of individuals diagnosed with HIV, injection drug use continues to present as a significant risk factor for HIV. Ninety-two percent. Very good. Okay. So, last one. People generally get their prescription pain relievers for non-medical use from which of the following sources? Sources. 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 <laughs> Multiple doctors, a single doctor, from family or friends, from a drug dealer, or from all of the above. Bless you. Okay, here we go. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little bit. Eighty percent said all of the above. Two percent from a drug dealer. Eight percent from family or friends. Five percent from a single doctor, and five percent from multiple doctors. Very interesting. Okay. So, opioids and opiates. What are they? What do they do? Okay, so let's go into a brief history. I could see already my uh, uh, animation. What we know is that opiates were first cultivated, you know, 5,000 years ago. They were used for anesthetic type purposes, ritual purposes, and for food as well. Laudanum, which is a, a mixture of, of, of uh, an alcohol solution and, uh, and, and opium, was used as a, as a painkiller during the 16th century. Um, we also know that morphine, which really accounts for about 12% of, of, of opium, um, was, was uh, extracted from, from opium in the, in the 19th century, used as a painkiller, and really that became known as the soldier's disease. Interestingly enough, around the, the, the turn of that century, what we saw was more and more women using opium, using laudanum, than men. Men were in the bars having a good time. Women weren't allowed generally in the bars. And so what they were home, they were home drinking laudanum and, and using opium in different ways. Morphine comes from the, 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 the Greek god Morpheus. Uh, and really, morphine is the most active ingredient uh, in opium. Codeine was first isolated in 1830 in, in, in France. The first opium war uh, was in 1839 when, when the British sent, uh, you know, the, the, the Chinese decided that they weren't really going to, you know, cooperate and, 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 you know, continue their production of opium. And so the, the, the Brits sent warships to, to try to change their mind. You know, it's interesting because we still have a war on drugs today. You know, I mean, nearly 200 years later, we still have a war on drugs and we still haven't figured that, that system out. 1874, heroin was developed. Uh, Congress banned uh, opium in, in, in 1905. Methadone was synthesized by the Germans in 1937. Really is, is to be used as, as part of uh, as surgical procedures as, as an anesthetic. The FDA approved several different uh, uh, narcotic analgesics, including Vicodin in, 80, in, in 84, Oxycontin in 95, and Percocet in 99. Um, there's this, by the way, uh, Opium and History by Martin Booth is really kind of a neat read. It's, it, it gives you a, sort of an overview and, and an example of how opium has really played a part, a huge part, in, in our existence over, over the centuries. 
So what are they? So opiate is really something that's derived from the opium poppy, uh, which includes morphine, codeine, and opium. All right, opium is really a latex that they that they use to. Uh, it, it really comes out in in latex form. An opioid is any compound that binds to the opiate receptors, and we'll talk about a little bit about those those receptors. Some sim semi synthetic opioids. Heroin is 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 one of those things. It's derived from uh, uh, morphine, buprenorphine from thebane. We know buprenorphine is has been around for a number of years and is really used uh, as part of a combination of uh, uh, naloxone and buprenorphine to, to produce uh, uh, suboxone. Some of the synthetics are uh, propoxyphene napsylate or Darvon, Darvon N, uh, fentanyl, methadone, and tramadol. People use it in different ways. You know, for, for a number of years there, people were thinking that if I smoked it, I wasn't going to get dependent, I wasn't going to become dependent upon it. Well, we know that that's not the case. People inject it, people take it intravenously or interrectally as well. And, and it's really considered a, uh, the, in terms of its legal designation as a, as a narcotic. Here's some pictures of it. In the top left, you see the, the latex, you see opium. You see China white, which we don't really see here on the on, on the West Coast. Um, uh, you see tar heroin at the bottom at the bottom left. You have the fentanyl transdermal patch, which is in the top right, which is used really, you know, in terms of uh, uh, for break breakthrough pain for uh, uh, oncology pain. You have the tramadol below that, and uh, and and you have Dr. House just below that. Um, uh, so in, in terms of, so is there a difference? Yeah, there really, there really is, there is a difference. Uh, opiates, again, are derived directly from the poppy. Uh, opioids are, are synthesized in some way. Morphine is an opioid, okay, and it's also an opiate. While as methadone is an opioid, but it's not an opiate because it was synthesized. Now, it's generally prescribed to treat pain, uh, reduce that signaling of pain messages. If you've ever had some extreme pain and you've taken a Vicodin or Percocet, boy, you notice how you know you relieve that suffering. It's it's incredible how well it works and how how quickly that sense and that feeling of well-being uh, you know flushes over you. If you weren't triggered in the previous uh, in the previous presentation on methamphetamine and cocaine, you might be triggered here. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, again, uh, so with that, the, the, the receptors that are most, you know, most involved in, in terms of the effect are the mu, kappa, and, and delta, uh, delta receptors. They're located throughout the brain and through the spine and the gut. Um, you know, some side effects are constipation, some sedation, a little itching. You know, initially when somebody uses, there's some nausea that goes along with it as well. So in terms of opioids and opiates, really what we're looking at is a full agonist. So that's, that was the answer to one of those questions. So those, it's really a full agonist. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. So we don't have, what's interesting is we, you know, uh, we were looking for, and Phil asked for one of those videos that shows sort of how opiates act on the receptor sites. We don't really have that, that information, you know, available in, in terms of that, that kind of media. But what we do know is that opiates, you know, go in, they attach to the receptors, you know, between the neurons, and they stop, they, they actually put a dampening on those pain signals that, that get transferred from, the, from a, you know, a peripheral part of an individual's body uh, to their brain. So we know that they're highly addictive. Uh, opiates, we wouldn't be talking about this if, if they weren't. However, what we do know is that, and I'll show you a slide later on, is they're trying to develop and they're looking to develop uh, analgesics that are not addictive, and they're, they're, they're coming a long way with that. They cause a rush of, of pleasure, a sensation that, that sort of just that nice sense of well-being, sort of like a warm blanket that, that, that people describe. They slow down our metabolism. They slow down the way we think. They slow down our reaction time. 
Uh, you know, and, and you've seen those commercials for opioid-induced constipation. So obviously it slows down a lot of things, in, in, including, in, including our, our daily rituals. Um, you know, it, it produces a euphoria. It suppresses the cough. If you've ever had just a nasty cough that wouldn't go away, and you've taken codeine, a codeine, you know, cough syrup or, or tincture of opium, man, it's amazing how well, how well it actually works. Um, it produces some dry mouth and some lethargy, you know, and, and uh, one of the, the, the acute effects is a nodding. People tend to sort of take a nap in the middle of a conversation that you might be having with them, uh, which at times can make for, you know, counseling an individual who's under the influence uh, a little bit difficult. Sedation, uh, you'll notice that anybody who's, who's under the influence of, of an opiate, their, their pupils are constricted or pinned, as, as it's known. And, and the, the exact opposite thing takes place. When somebody's in withdrawals, their pupils are dilated, and you can, you can recognize that. Um, we talked about constipation, confusion, slowered heart rate. What really gets people, and, and, and this is really what takes an individual's life, is, is that respiratory depression. It really just slows the, the breathing, breathing process down you know, uh, until somebody quits breathing. And that is dose-related. Clearly, that is dose-related. And, and that's one of the real values, and we'll talk a little bit later, about buprenorphine is that buprenorphine or Suboxone, has, it, it has a high safety profile because it doesn't do that, because it's not so dose dependent. Uh, some of the things that, that go along with that are infectious diseases, you know, people in terms of sharing needles, hepatitis C. It used to be certainly here in, in treatment rates uh, about 15, 16 years ago, in treatment rates for HCV were about 85 to 95 percent. That's come down considerably, in part because now we have medications to treat HCV, but also because a number of people who, prior to having really successful medications for HCV, people ultimately succumbed and died from, from HCV. And number, you know, especially the individuals who lived long enough to, for it to be really impactful. Abscesses, septicemia, blood poisoning, endocarditis, generally these are related to injection practices. These are usually things that go along with that. Usually you don't see that for individuals who are taking it, you know, orally or who, who are smoking opiates. In terms of withdrawal symptoms, I know these are, these, there's a lot of words up there. So, um, the, you know, the, the, the intensity varies with you know, the type of drug, the length of drug, and, and how long somebody's been, been using it, uh, as well as the amount that, uh, that somebody's, you know, taking it. When somebody stops using, the system sort of wakes up. It's kind of like with alcohol. You know, alcohol depresses the, sy the system. When you stop drinking it, boy, everything sort of comes to life. The same thing with opiates. You know, it, it, a narcotic, it works really to put a damp cloth on you know, on, on your sensations, on your pain, you know, pain sensations. But also what ends up happening is your gut begins to wake up and you get nausea and vomiting and, and diarrhea to go along with it as well. Usually uh, for the short acting uh, 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 drugs, for instance, like heroin, um, you know, the, the peak withdrawals, and when I say peak, usually 36 to 72 hours, that's the peak, but people still aren't comfortable after that period of time. If they were, or I should say comfortable after that period of time, if they were, people would, you know, more often be able to stop using. But what we see is that there's a protracted withdrawal. And, and that protracted withdrawal is really related to the half-life of the drug. The half-life of, of, uh, of, of heroin is, is, is generally like four to six hours. Methadone, 24 to 36 hours. Suboxone's even longer than that. And so what we end up seeing is that for individuals who've been on a substance for any significant period of time, they could have some sleep disturbance, some insomnia for extended you know, periods of time, months, eh, months on end. Opioid withdrawals, you got the severe nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, teary or running eyes, running, you know, uh, uh, watery eyes, runny nose. 
you get that goose bumps, you know, people have the difficulty sort of getting warm. The muscle aches and the, and the, the kicking that they talk, where there, there's that just that involuntary uh, 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 discharge of electronic signals to the legs, where it just causes somebody to have a, a spasm. Um, you know, there's the fever, the yawning, uh, and, and certainly the insomnia that, that, that goes along with that. So where do they come from? So where, where do these opiates come from? And we've always heard about Afghanistan. And the fact of the matter is, is that the majority of the world's production of, of opiates and, and, and of the, the popium does come from Afghanistan. But moreover, that's not really where our drugs come from, you know, in, in terms of that. Most of the, 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 you can see that in Mexico and in South America, there's also pretty significant production of, of um uh, of, of uh, the opium poppy. So if you look at um, the, the red line, uh, the, let's see if maybe I can, if you look at the red line, the red section here, this is all the production uh, of, of the opium poppy from Afghanistan right there. Now, if you look at the production in Mexico, it's that black line right there. And most of the production that comes from Mexico and South America ends up here in the United States. Now, Along with that, I want to talk just a little bit about what's happened to the pricing of it. While we've seen since 19, 1981, the, the percentage of the purity of, of opiates has, has consistently climbed and leveled off a little bit, the price has consistently come down. We see that with, we saw that with methamphetamine, and certainly we see that with methamphetamine. I think the, the cost of a gram of methamphetamine, as, as Beth said, is like 70 bucks. It's as low as it's been probably in 20 years. And as you can see, the same thing is happening with heroin. And, and, and that, is, that is a result of more and more people actually going and beginning using, using heroin. This is uh, from our friends at the DEA. So here's how some of the things are actually smuggled into the United States. And you can see how creative people are. This, this looks like a blow pop or whatever, but it's brought into the United States as, as looking as though it's candy in this instance, or it's, it's smuggled into a can of beans, you know, a large can of beans. So you can see how different, there's different mechanisms and how sophisticated people are in terms of getting drugs into the country. This is a little less sophisticated, but still effective at the same time, is they put it into uh, the, the various auto parts and, 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 and you know, uh, uh, just finding ways to conceal it in order to bring it into the United States. So why do we care about this? Why is it, why is it really important to us? Well, you know, what's, what's interesting is it, it felt like it wasn't so important as long as it was as just in the inner city. You know, it wasn't really an issue. Heroin's not gone away. I mean, that, the fact of the matter is, is that anybody who's worked in the field or worked at an OTP for any length of time recognizes that, you know what, we've never run out of people to work with. The, there's, it's different now. It's a, it's a little bit different. And part of it is, is it's, it's getting into the suburbs. And that's in one way, sort of one of the tragic ways is, is why people are paying so much more attention to it you know, at, at this point in time. But what we do know is that in terms of HIV risk, it's, you know, you, you, you know the male-to-male -male sexual contact really uh, drives the system. It's about 60 to 70 percent of, of all HIV uh, diagnosis in the, in the country. But if you look down to that orange line, injection drug use is, is really uh, accounts for less than 10 percent of, of all HIV conversions or seroconversions. Now, part of that is, is primarily because of, of, you know, the OTPs and people doing such a good job in getting the word out about the connection between, you know, needle sharing and, and, uh, and the, the potential for, for, for conversion. Now, if we look at persons diagnosed with HIV and, and you know, infection across ethnicity, you can see that the African-American community really bears the, the brunt of it, about 50%. Of, of, of the individuals who were diagnosed in 2014 uh, were of African, you know, African-American uh, ethnicity. 
Okay, so and and that's that's a challenge. I mean, one of the things that we have to do is to is to really uh, get into those communities like you guys are now. Get that information out. Make treatment available. What's interesting is that we still don't make needles available. We still, I mean, that's still sort of a, a subculture, and I think that's something that's really important for us to be able to do. Is and 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 hopefully at some point in time the federal government will take a look at that. So in 2014, now how did this compares to the, you know, to the rest of the, you know, those in, individuals who who are HIV positive? Uh, it's it's about it's about a third. So you know that's what we're looking at in two, 2014. The number of deaths of persons with diagnosed with HIV infected ever classified as stage three uh, AIDS was was about 12,000 people. So persons living with HIV attributed to uh, uh, injection drug use, again, we're looking at about 130, 140,000 people uh, uh, nationwide at this point in time. And I think overall what we're looking at is, now the, the next slide says about 955,000. I think it's probably just over a million. They're talking about a million two people you know, around the, in, in the U.S., who've been diagnosed with HIV. So if you take a look at that, it's a, it's a, it's relatively small percentage at this point in time, but a significant percentage. And we know where to find these guys. We can find them at OTPs. You know, we can find them getting care for uh, for their uh, their their heroin or their opiate addiction within within that sector. So here's just a little bit, uh, you know, information, a little bit uh, additional data in terms of you, you see that the, the trending down, you know, when um, antiretrovirals came into play, you can see that the overall rate of HIV uh, in terms of in terms of deaths uh, has has come down, and that's because we actually have we have active we have treatments available for it at this point in time. I'm just going to skip through that. Um, this here. This was taken in uh, 2006. This is a, a, a photo of uh, some vending machines in Porto, uh, Portugal. They had the International Society of Addiction Medicine, uh, and they had vending machines right next to one another on the street for syringes as well as for condoms. I thought that was remarkable. It's like, wow, you can you walk down, you can, you know, I, and, and I don't know what the cost is. It, it, you know, it may have been like one euro you know, in order to get that. But I thought it was reasonable. Now, it's taken us 11 years to get to this point, okay? 11 years. However, it's great to see that right now Nevada, just this month, now has vending machines for syringes. I think that's a wonder, what a great step for, for us to take in, in relation to that. So uh, hopefully, you know, we're, 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 you know, catching up maybe to the rest of the world in terms of, uh, how we look at sort of preventative sort of measures in terms of looking at HIV. This was this just came out this 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 month, so it's it's uh, pretty recent information. In terms of HIV infection among persons who inject uh, drugs by sex and and uh, uh, race or ethnicity, as you can see, what's what's kind of interesting here uh, is that 47% uh, of the females. And 37% of uh, are, are Caucasian, while 37% of uh, you know of the of the females are uh, African Americans. You can see it's it's still really dominated uh, by by African Americans and and Latinos in 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 terms of the, the HIV infection rates. That was as of uh, as of 2015. In terms of the overdose risk, and we've we've seen a lot, we've heard a lot about overdose, and so you know, in terms of what we're seeing in the emergency departments, about a thousand people are treated in the EDs every every single day for uh, an overdose that's that's related to or some complications that are related to uh, prescription opioids. That's a lot of folks, but more importantly, what we're seeing is about almost 100 people die a day. That's about one person every 20 minutes who are dying of an opioid-related uh, uh, overdose. That's a lot of folks. We can do something about that. We know that we can do something about that. Now, in terms of uh, this is this is 
I don't know. That might even be better. I don't know. Um, that might help this. That might help this slide out. I, I, I actually tried to find slides that were uh, a slide that was a little bit more clear about this. What you're seeing here, this is the rise of overdose related to well uh, 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 related to drug poisoning. Okay. Last year was the first year that the overdoses related to drug poisoning surpassed the number of individuals who were killed in the Vietnam War. That's huge, okay? Over 55,000 last year. Now, if you look at that, this line here is motor vehicle crashes, all right? In 2009, we actually surpassed the number of, of deaths related to, to motor vehicles. If you look at this one, the, the orange one here, firearms, okay? Now, we know that there's gazillions. We probably have a firearm for every individual in the, in the United States at this point. But what we're seeing is that overdose are now beginning to surpass that. And But the interesting, we can do something about it. And you guys being here and talking to your clients, you know, talking to your patients is one of those things that we can do about it. There's a lot of things that are going on within the high schools and the, uh, and the middle schools, talking to kids about these sorts of things, which is incredibly important. Here's the, 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 the deaths. Uh, this, this is, I tried to you know, make this as complicated as I could, and I, I think I probably did. Um, so this is death rates for opioid drugs in 2000, 2005, 2010, and 2015. And, and uh, you know, you can, you can see how that rate has increased over a period of time. And what's, what's fascinating, though, is how the Western states, how we've, we've done a pretty good job of it so far. However, if you look in the, the Northeast and, you know, in, in places like West Virginia, Ohio, Kentucky, they haven't done such a good job about it. And I really, I believe that that has a lot to do with, with you know, uh, our government here in, in California, the amount of services that we have available, and, and the information that we have available to individuals as well. So this is, this is another way of looking at overdose deaths, but it's actually by opioid. Uh, this is any opioid. The, the one I'd, I'd really like you to, the, the two that I'd like you to pay, pay particular attention about is the blue line, which is uh, the heroin. And then also this orange line, which is synthetic opioids, which is actually which is fentanyl and tramadol and, and and Percocet and those those sorts of things. But if you look at that, look at the steep curve. I mean, that's huge. If you you know it's it's going along, you know, relatively, you know, if if you look at that in in the, in 10 years, it's it's pretty stable. But then from 2010 on, there's a huge spike. What do you think that's about? This is where you come in. What do you think? What, what, what happened in, in 2010 to make it such that all of a sudden we have a huge spike when over the past 10 years it's, it's moving along at, at its own pace? Doctors prescribing it. Okay, that might be one. Okay, yes. Access. Okay, so so access. So we're we're thinking that that's moreover related to the availability of prescriptions. Okay. So let's take a let's take a little closer look at. It. Thank you guys for sharing. Okay. So this is um, two milligrams of fentanyl right next to a penny. Okay. So what we know about fentanyl. Okay. Is 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 it strong? I mean, it's you know, and and that's what basically what a fatal overdose. You know, the amount that a potential fatal overdose would, okay. Have you heard of carfentanil? Carfentanil is an analog of, of fentanyl. And it's used as a, as a major tranquilizer for animals, like elephants, okay. Now, um, carfentanil is, is 10,000 times stronger than morphine. 10,000 times. Okay. Now that's fentanyl, and that's an equivalent to what would kill a human being. Carfentanil is a hundred times stronger. Carfentanil is a hundred times stronger than fentanyl. Okay. Two hundred micrograms, or about one hundredth of what you see there, P 
could kill somebody. In fact, you know, you saw in, in terms of, you, you saw those guys in the, in the hazmat suits when they go and they clean up the meth labs. When people are producing carfentanil, they're making that because it gets absorbed in the skin so readily that it can cause overdose. And that's what we're seeing. That's what we're beginning to see nationwide. And that's part of, you know, I showed you that, that map of what was going on in the northeastern United States. That's really, the fentanyl and the car fentanyl is what's really driving those overdoses in that part of the world. Okay, but it's not just that part of the world because what we're seeing is overdose deaths in other parts of the world as well, in Sweden. And you can see that here, this is the graph for Sweden right there. You can see that it's increasing. This is in, uh, this is in the, the, the UK, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, this is in Esto um, Estonia, and this is the UK. So what we're seeing is an increase in these things worldwide. Now, it used to be that most of the, the fentanyl and the car fentanyl was coming in from China. Now what's happening is it's coming in from Mexico as well, and it's being produced down there. And it's being cut into, it's being cut into pills that are supposed to be like codeine or Vicodin. It's also being cut into the heroin, which is, which is a cause of problem. What we saw we, we, here in, in California where we saw the, the greatest impact was in Sacramento uh, about, uh, I don't know, about eight months ago. It was summertime last year. That's where the, we saw the greatest impact of fentanyl and fentanyl-related analogs. Now, here, uh, if, if you look in terms of fentanyl seizures by states, again, this is really driven. If you look at Ohio, you look at Massachusetts, New Hampshire and Pennsylvania, that's where a lot of the drug is showing up in that part of the world, moreover than here in California. Now there's some, you know, uh, I, we, you know Dr. Gary Sai has some, you know, some idea of why that, that, why that is, and I'll, I'll share that with you. But these are some of the fentanyl uh, analogs that are seized, and what we're seeing is that the DEA is finding more and more and more of these things that are, that are being produced. Here's just some warnings about car fentanyl um, that, that come out from the DEA and the CDC. You know, and, and this is really, it started to take place in like 2015, but people recognized it real quick because what ends up happening is that the first responders, you know, they come in, they recognize it as an opioid overdose. They, they give a shot of naloxone or Narcan to, you know, as an antidote, which usually lasts about 20 to, you know, 20 to 40 minutes, somewhere in that neighborhood. And what's happening is they don't have enough Narcan to keep these people stable until they can get them into, uh, into a hospital. And so the first responders basically don't have the tools, enough of the tools, to allow them to transport an individual to safety. And that's because these drugs are so potent. If they were dealing with just a regular heroin overdose or you know, Vicodin, codeine, Oxycontin, something like that, you know, the shot of, 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 uh, of Narcan would, would suffice. But now they're having to give multiple doses of this. So here's the, the, you know, what we saw in terms of the, the, uh, the opioid overdose. And you can see it's more of rural California. And that's what we saw in other parts of the nation as well. But it's really impacted rural California in, in terms of the opioid, uh, opioid overdose. Now, what we saw here in, in Los Angeles County, as Dr. Sai mentioned, he says, you know, there's 40 deaths between 2011 and 2013. 62 in 2014, okay, and 46 in 2015. So it doesn't, it's not really comparing. One of the things that he thought that, was re, that it was related to was sort of the diversity of, of our city, the diversity of our area, and that he, his sense was that more and more uh, what we see are Caucasian individuals getting prescriptions, getting access to prescriptions, and... Uh, uh, where, whereby it's included in some of those prescriptions, it's not happening here. In, in, and so that diversity that we have, he recognizes as being somewhat of a protective factor. So, um, so here, what we, what we see, this is overdose. These are all the counties 
here in California. Those are all the counties. And, and as you can see, all the, most of these counties that, that really uh, are accounting for most of the opioid overdose deaths are up in Northern California. They're not, they're not down here. And part of it you know, has to do with, you know, they don't have as much in terms of resources. Uh, first responders, you know, may have to drive 100 miles in order to get to, you know, to get to somebody, and by that time, it's 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 a little too late. So who's using them? Yes. Al, uh, could could you? I just might be my naivete, but why would manufacturers, the manufacturers be putting fentanyl into these? Yeah, it, 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 it seems kind of crazy, doesn't it? It's like, look, we're, we're killing off all our customers. Yes. You know, I, you know, it's, I, I, you know, I think that's a question that, that people have asked. It's like, why, why are you killing off? I don't think that they recognized the potency and the strength. I don't think that the people who are putting it in there are nearly as sophisticated as they, you know, as they will be over, over a period of time. And, and when you see that one, you know, 200 micrograms, when you see such a small dose of carfentanil being able to kill somebody, how do you, how do you fraction that out? How do you fraction out 200 micrograms? But why even include it at all? Well, because uh, it, it can be manufactured, it, it, you know, more cheaply. Uh, it's it it has a potency that you can put it in with with other opiates to. Uh, to make it so much more potent than you would have to in terms of heroin. Now, so, yes, absolutely. I think the other thing is there's a market for it. Uh, people buy it, and if you think about the drug using line, uh, Beth showed you some great data earlier that in the last three years, the drug use in And, and thanks, Tom. And, and I think to add to that, I, I think that sometimes people don't know what they're buying. You know, I think I think they're you know the people you know are are you know uh, don't actually know what what and and we see that with other drugs as well. Is that when you know when when people are looking to purchase something, it's not really what they're getting. Somebody else? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. And maybe they don't have to spend as much, you know, as, as they're spending in terms of heroin and use as much, you know, heroin as they would, uh, you know, uh, they'd have to use a lot more. So uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, they have. And are they using? I mean, are, are they coming in contact with with fentanyl and, and car fentanyl, or is their their contacts? Okay. And and if if I may, I mean, this is great. So what what's their sense of sort of the the relative risk about using that? Because what what we know is, as as the perceived risk of a substance goes up, its use goes down, and we're seeing that with cannabis now. As the perceived risk of cannabis goes down, the use goes up. So how does that how does that play? Going back to the, the addict's way of thinking, yeah, is like the there's there's this high um, this, they they want that, that that big rush, and so the higher the risk. For them, that that draws that that's their draw. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, the more risk there is, like the gentleman over there was saying, uh -huh. the more alluring it is. The more they want to, they want to. The more they the want that. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that.
So let's see, who's, who's using these things? So we know why we care. Uh, there's that connection with HIV, the, the, the overdose rate, uh, you know, has, has gone up, the connection with, with HCV as well. So we know that there's certain risk factors. You know, pre, you know uh, overlapping prescriptions, you know, getting multiple prescriptions, we know that. Taking high doses, you know, over a period of time. Uh, you know, usually when, when a prescription is given for acute pain, you know, you, you, you know, the pain goes away, you don't need to get a subsequent, you know, prescription. But it's, you know, and usually what doctors are, are, are watching for is somebody who comes back in for an acute pain issue and they're looking to get that second prescription. That's usually, you know, the sort of the kicker or the, that, that sign that something's going on. Individuals with mental illness. Clearly, with any substance use, what we know is the more serious the mental illness, the greater the likelihood of substance use. And then living within, uh, you know, a rural or low-income low community. So, um, in terms of who's using it, you know, what, what we find is that people who are using other substances are more likely to be addicted to heroin. And I know that uh, there's uh, one young, young lady mentioned here that what, what we're seeing now, and, and I, I, it's, uh, I just spoke to uh, a colleague of mine uh, at an OTP, the Matrix Institute, uh, last week. He says, you know, it used to be that people were speedballing with uh, cocaine and, and heroin. Now what we're seeing is a lot more meth use, and people are actually combining their meth use and, and, uh, and their heroin use. So, and again, it goes along with, who, who mentioned that earlier? There you go. And, and one of the things that they're seeing is exactly what you mentioned is, these are, young, these are younger users that are, that are coming into the system. They're younger, but what's fascinating is that they have an extensive career or history of use. And so when we see somebody who's like, you know, 20, 22, 23, we're thinking, oh, they don't have much of an extensive use or history, but in fact they do. And so uh, that's one of the one of the issues that we're that we're seeing uh, within some of the clinics. In 2012, almost or oh, just over 250 million prescriptions for for opioids were written. 250, that's almost, that's certainly one for every adult, you know, and, and, but, you know, and, and it's about one for two thirds of, of, of every single individual in the United States. That's a lot of prescriptions. In terms of opioid misuse and serious mental illness, what, what we know is about one in eight individuals, one in eight individuals who are abusing opioids have a serious mental illness, one in eight. Okay. We, you probably think it would be a little bit higher than that, and actually, it, you know, in fact, it, it might be. But what we know is that people are using opiates. People who have, you know, uh, uh, in mental illness are using it because they have, you know, panic attacks, because they have, you know, social anxiety and, and serious, you know, uh, uh, agoraphobia. Those are some of the reasons why these people are using, using these substances in particular, opioids in particular. Now, what's interesting is that, you know, it used to be that people who are uh, uh, entering treatment or people whose first exposure to opiates was heroin. But we saw that that changed. We saw that in the 1990s, what you see is that all of a sudden it's about 50-50 in terms of their exposure from prescription opiates to heroin. Now what we're seeing is that the, the, uh, uh, the exposure to, to opiates now is coming more over from the prescription opiates. And that's, that's really the issue. That's, that's primarily because the availability, there's so much of these drugs available. What was interesting was, you know, when, when we had the, uh, uh, the real estate boom, you know, back in what, 2007, 2000, uh, just before 2007, 2008, a lot of our clients would go to open houses they would go to these open houses and they would go through the medicine cabinets to find people who, you know, to find the, uh, the, the, the various prescriptions that individuals had, you know, in their medicine cabinet and figure out that they could take those. You have a question over there. Yes.
So in, in terms of prescription opiates, absolutely. The continued, the continued access to that, it, it takes a lot of resources. But what happened is what we've seen is that instead of people continuing their prescription opiate use, what they're doing is they're switching to things that are a lot more, uh, you know, a lot more affordable, like heroin. And so, yeah, initially for somebody to maintain you know, to, for somebody to maintain a prescription habit, they either have to have some sort of insurance or, you know, be able to get it from, uh, you know, the prescription mills or something like that. Or, again, they have to have those resources because undoubtedly, as you say, and that's, a, that's an excellent point, these things aren't cheap. They're, they're pretty expensive. Thank you. Uh, you. You saw this. This I, I won't really spend it in much in the way of time, but... Uh, on this, but what we see is in terms of uh, illicit drug use, and and what might be interesting is while uh, marijuana is considered an illicit drug federally, it's not going to be considered in some states. It's not going to be considered an illicit drug. So it'll be interesting to see how that changes. So in terms of past month of illicit drug use, what you see is about 22 million people reported marijuana use. But again, in uh, uh, in 2015, almost 4 million people uh, reported using opioids, uh, or at least gaining them, getting access to them on the illicit market. Now, uh, this here is past month of prescription pain, pain relievers, stimulants, and sedatives. So if you look at the group that really dominates, when we talk about the people who are really using it, it's that 18 to 25 group. Uh, across the board in terms of pain relievers, tranquilizers, stimulants. It's that, that group is really the group that we're most challenged with these, these days. And those are the young people that we're seeing in treatment because they've been using for a significant period of time. Now, we, there's, there's actually a group that we consider extreme opioid users. Now, in group one, and, and this, this was... This was um, uh, some some work done uh, out of out of Yale University. Uh, there's group one is is individuals who got one prescription, and generally we recognize that somebody who gets one prescription, it's it's for an acute instance of pain. Then there was another group where they got four you know four prescriptions. Those are people that they recognize as individuals, you know, and it's usually four prescriptions from the same doc. All right. Now, what you see in that other group is that this, this, uh, the bottom line, group three, are individuals who are going to 10 different prescribers, 10 different prescribers in order to get, you know, to, to get their opiates. Those are the guys that they've labeled actually prescription, you know, the, the extreme opioid users, where they're, they're shopping around in order to get as much of the drug as they possibly can. Those are the doctor shoppers. And that group, the age group of that, is right around 30. If you can see, you can see the guys that are getting it for uh, a single episode of pain. You know, they're, 100% of those guys are, are getting it from, from one doctor. And it, it varies straight across the age group. I mean, there's, there's no real blip on the screen there. Same with group two. Those are the guys that have some chronic pain, maybe getting it from multiple prescribers, but not 13 plus prescribers. And that's that age group of right around 30. That's, that's really the challenge. Those are the groups that, that doctors are paying a little bit more you know, uh, 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 attention to these days. Now, in terms of heroin use, and, and, you know, and, and what we're looking at in terms of demographics, as you can see, the demographics, females have increased you know, uh, from, from 2002 to 2004, that period, to 2011 to 2013, 100% increase in females in terms of their exposure and use of, uh, of, of heroin. Uh, the age group, 18 to 25, that went up 100% as well. Uh, if you look at non-Hispanic whites, that's gone up to you know 114 percent over that period of time. But then this answers your question a little bit about the household income. If you look at the household income, you know it's pretty stable across the heroin users, which is which is kind of in, in, you know interesting. That 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 stability. 
But the heroin-related deaths, you know, in that period of time, almost a 300% increase. So what we're seeing now is that what people were using in terms of their prescriptions, now they're shifted. Now they're looking at using heroin. Now, in terms of the source of the pain, you know, most of us thought, at least I, I thought for years and years, that it was these people who were doctor shopping. You know, those were people where people were getting their, their, their prescriptions. They're not. The majority of people, over 50%, are actually getting it from friends or relatives, from us. Okay? That's where they're getting it from. It's not from multiple doctors. If you look at 22% of them got it from a single doctor. That, that, you know, that's about 75%. Only 3% got it from multiple doctors, and that's that group of doctor shoppers that we're actually talking about. Now, this is, this is a, 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 you know, sort of a, a little complicated uh, in, in terms of that, but what you see in terms of the, the gray line is this is uh, the, the, uh, the number of, well, let me go, the, the y-axis down here is the number of days of use. Across the bottom is the number of days of use, going from any days to 365 days. Now, this line here, the gray line, is given by a friend or relative for free. And as you can see, the more somebody's using, the less willing a friend or relative is to give it to somebody because we know that they're coming back and, hey, look, I want to save some of these for me, you know, so I'm not going to give them all to you, right? If you look at the red line, that's prescribed by one physician. If you look at this purple line right here, okay, that is, uh, let's see, my eyes are, uh, that is bought, purchased from a friend or relative. So now there's, they move from getting it from free. It's like, okay, if you want these, I'll sell them to you, but I'm not going to give them to you, all right? And then the other line, this blue line down here, and you can see it's increasing, is bought from a drug dealer or a stranger. So what happens is you can see sort of as the person, as they begin to use more and more, they begin to get their drug from a different source, more over the illicit market. And that's really what we're talking about is developing that addiction not really developing a de dependence because we know, but developing that addiction in, in, in terms of maintaining their habit. However, there are things that we can do. And we've seen some things that have been done. In New York State, what they did in, in 2012, they required prescribers to check the state registration. And as a result, there was a 75% drop in patients who were seeing multiple prescribers. 75%, that's huge just by doing that. You know, the cures here in California, you know, we have a system like that where prescribers need to go and see if individuals have, have received multiple prescriptions or prescriptions from other, other individuals. In Florida, they regulated the pain clinics and as a result, there's a 50% decrease in overdose deaths. Purely and simply, we can do things about this. In, in Tennessee, again, they required prescribers to go out and check a registry, and there was a 36% drop in patients who were seeing multiple prescribers. So we know that we can have an impact on this. Additionally, what we're seeing is, is the, the, the CDC come out with uh, guidelines, prescribing guidelines, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But now let's talk about you know, uh, Rx for older adults. Uh, I'm almost there. I'm not quite there, okay? But I'm getting close. Tom would probably say I'm already there. Um, but we're talking, for, for the sake of older adults right now, we're talking about 65 and up, okay? So they account for 13% of the U.S. population, but 33% of all prescribed medications. That's huge. And what we know, what we see in terms of... Uh, uh, what the impact that alcohol has on, on older guys like me is we can't drink as much, you know, because it has a much greater effect than it did when we, when we were younger. They're three times more likely than the general population to, to get a, a prescribed medication. On average, they take four and a half medications a day, you know, and with our, our failing sight and 
you know, God knows. I mean, when they hand you that that whole list, that book of of instructions, it's not just take as daily, you know, as as required here or AS or uh, PRN or whatever. They give you a whole pack of the stuff that you have to read. How many of you guys actually read that? All right, we got one. I love it. All right, you. <laughs> You you probably you probably read your auto manual too before you get in a, and, and drive. I would I would think that's you know and that's and that's cool. That's a good thing. I, you know, mine's still brand new. I'll sell you mine when you. Um, about almost three million older adults abuse RX drugs in California. Okay, that that's huge. That's huge. So in terms of medical exposure, you can see the older you get, okay, both males and females, the older you get, the more likely you are to get to get a prescription. Uh, and, and in terms of the reason you get prescriptions, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, the, the drug misuse, as they say, is, is, is motivated more by emotional and psychological distress in women. I think a male probably did that work, you know? That's, that's what I would say. That was probably research done by a male. Um, women, but however, you know, all joking aside, really, it's generated generally by trauma, by either, either you know, sexual, uh, sexual abuse or physical abuse. That's usually what, you know, uh, it, what, what's occurring to um, individuals who are coming into treatment as well. What we see is about 65 to 70 percent of the women who are coming in for treatment have reported either sexual or physical trauma in, you know, in their past. For men, it's usually, um, you know, some, you know, uh, uh, problematic social and behavioral problems um, or ED. Just Really? Come on. Oh my God. Is it, is it, is it, what is it? The food coma has set in or what? You guys are killing me. I don't know. All right. So I think what, I think what we're, let's see, we've, uh, we've got about uh, two hours left. Okay. Um, so how did we get here? So we'll, we'll take a break in a little bit. How did we get here? So here's a video that I want to show you by Nora Volkov who's the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And she just describes how it is that we got to where we are today. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, almost afternoon, but it's a, a great pleasure to be here with you and actually to discuss something that uh, relates to the healthcare system, obviously but it's um, different from what we have been hearing. And I'm going to start by asking you a question. We're all in the healthcare system. I'm a physician. And the question is, what happens when the healthcare system, instead of relieving the pain of suffering of the patients, creates it? Just as it's currently happening with a prescription opioid um, that we're living in the United States. And the amount of pain and suffering is enormous. In 2014, there were 18,000 people that died from an overdose secondary to a prescription opioid. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. Behind it, also in 2014, we saw 10,000 people dying from an overdose of heroin, mostly individuals who have been becoming addicted to their prescription of opioids shifted to heroin. We've seen significant increases in infections with hepatitis C. We've seen significant increases in mortality associated with endocarditis from, inject, from injection practices of contaminated material. We've seen an extremely st steep rise in the number of neonatal abstinence syndromes that are flooding the neonatal intensive care units throughout the United States. And this crisis was created by the healthcare system. And when something like this happens, of course, our responsibility is not denied. Our responsibility is look at it and understand why it happened so we can revert it 
and prevent it from happening again. So why? Why did it happen? Paradoxically, out of a very good intention initiative to treat the pain of patients. So in 2000, when the Joint Accreditation Committee required that hospitals and their physicians screen and treat pain in their patients, that in 2000 followed a steep increase in the number of prescription opioids across the country that over the past 10 years have been more than 200 million prescription of opioids annually. And this translates into billions of opioid pills that have flooded our communities. Now why then this links to the diversion, their abuse of these readily available prescription opioid tablets? Well, it's simple pharmacology. Opioid medications, which we use in principle to treat severe pain, are extremely effective for acute severe pain, such as surgery or trauma. And they do this by binding to opioid receptors, and that inhibits pain signals. But opioid receptors are also located in brain reward regions, and these medications activate them. And that's why they can be very pleasurable. That's why they are diverted. And that's why they can be addicted. So it's something that we as healthcare providers caused. It's our fault. And so with that, as she mentioned, it's our responsibility to sort of fix this. And so she mentioned JCHO, okay, and the guidelines that mandate, mandated, you know, pain really as, or the evaluation as pain as the fifth vital sign. So anytime you're in a hospital setting, they go to you and they ask you, so rate your pain. You see the, you know, the, those little smiley faces and the unhappy faces, and that's what they're, that's what they're looking at. When opioids are prescribed properly, really, we don't see a lot of addiction. We don't. It's 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 rare when we see that. However, what we do know is that those vulnerabilities are the same for prescription opiates as they are for other drugs, and they include genetic sort of genetic differences. Genetics plays about 40 to 60% of it. There's social and environmental factors that, that play a role in that uh, as well. Trauma and physical and sexual abuse, they play into that as well. So there's a number of things, you know, it has to be that, so to speak, that perfect storm, so to speak, in order for, for somebody to develop one of these things. There is such a thing, though, as is considered pseudo-addiction. And really what you're looking at in terms of pseudo-addiction is somebody whose pain is not managed properly. Then they begin to use more medication than, than would be prescribed. They begin to run out of their prescription more quickly than they would otherwise. And they begin to engage in that drug-seeking behavior. And so for those individuals, we really have to look at whether or not it's we're really talking about an addiction or we're talking about where their pain isn't managed properly. And there's a difference between dependence. There's really a difference between physical dependence and addiction. And it really comes into play is that behavior. We can all be dependent upon a substance. We can be. But if we don't engage in certain behaviors that cause it to move from dependence to addiction, then it's not an addiction. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as it relates to opiate maintenance medications like methadone, like Suboxone, and the difference and, and what, we, what we look to strive for in terms of helping somebody develop a recovery. So again, this is just a little bit more of, uh, you know, in terms of percentage of U.S. population with past month use of pharmaceuticals by type, 
And as you can see, again, the, the you know, pain relievers really dominates. And what we know is, is they work. You know, outside of, outside of the United States, there's only one country that really can compete with us on a per capita basis for the amount of opiates used, and that's Canada. You know, the rest of the world doesn't use opiates like we do. They don't have the resources like we do. They haven't been brought up with a system that says, hey, if you're, if you're uncomfortable with something, go see your doctor and get a prescription. They don't have ads, advertisements on television for any number of ad more, ad, ad, you know, uh, uh, affliction that an individual might have to where you can go to your own doctor. They don't have those same kinds of ads. Here's what we saw. So, you know, we talked a little bit about sort of the, the, the growing number of prescriptions that, uh, that, that have been prescribed. And what you see here are uh, the, in blue, you see oxycodone. Uh, and in, in the red, you see hydrocodone on, on, this, uh, on this half here. And you look at the number of, you know, prescriptions, 134 million prescriptions. And then you compare this on the right side. I can't do that. But if you compare on the right side, you can see the number of opioid-related deaths. Okay, And in 2013, that was 16,000. But you can see it's pretty comparable between males and females. And you can see that it's fairly linear across both of those graphs. There's a direct correlation between the number of prescriptions and the number of opioid-related deaths. Again, this is past year or past month of, of, uh, uh, of heroin use for persons 12 and older. Uh, again, this is, these, these are uh, males, these are females. And then the heroin overdose deaths. And you can see that spike there in 2010. Now, what's interesting, though, is that the prescription opiates, that epidemic began right around here, OK? And yet, the deaths related to opiates didn't go up until there. And the reason being is because of abuse for, uh, formulation of OxyContin. And it's directly true. So in July and December of 2010, OK, that's when they brought in the abuse deterrent formulation of, of Oxy. And how that works is it's sort of like a Skittle. You know when you ever, you know, you, know, you crush a Skittle and it just sort of, it, it congeals but changes its shape a little bit, all right? Well, that's what they did with OxyContin. And so now instead of being able to, to you know, dissolve it in, in water, it makes it really, it makes it gummy so that it can't be injected. And look what happened. All those people that were using OxyContin when they realized that they weren't going to be able to get any, you know, any of the any of the oxy that was other than the abuse deterrent, began to use heroin. That is not an accident, okay? So it's not like they just said, okay, I, I you know, I can't get oxycontin, I'm going to quit. No, it's like I can't get oxycontin, I'm going to start using heroin, and that's where that transformation went over. And if you look at the introduction, more people, 70% of the people that were using Oxy switched to heroin after the abuse deterrent formulation kicked in. Now, what we're doing about it. What we're going to do is take a break. All right, so, so what are we doing about it? Let's, let's take a look. Nora Volkov talked about, you know, about how we got here, and we talked about that. Let's, let's listen to Nora, Dr. Volkov, about how we can sort of fix this thing, how we can address it. What are some of the tools that we have to uh, to work on, the, you know, as as solutions to work on the problem? We have effective medications for the treatment of opioid use disorders. Three classes: methadone, buprenorphine, extended release naltrexone. They are effective in preventing relapse. They are effective in preventing overdoses. They improve outcomes in neonatal abstinence syndrome. They prevent infections with HIV and HIV. And yet, only a fraction of those patients who have an addiction to an opioid are prescribed these medications. And, and I just say, well, why? There are many factors why, why we are not treating patients. And certainly, one of it 
relates to stigma, ignorance, that education hopefully can address. But there is also the reality of the structural needs. There's not sufficient capability to be able to provide a treatment of those suffering from a substance use disorder. And when it comes to insurances, also, there are many roadblocks that the patients has to undergo in order to get the approval to get one of these medications. And some of these insurance plans actually limit the amount of time that you can prescribe the medication to treat the opioid addiction to that patient, even though the evidence consistently shows that addiction is a chronic disease that requires a chronic model of treatment. So yes, we have to do structural changes. And some of those structural changes, of course, are going to require that we invest resources. But you know, as we speak now, just as I speak, and as we're standing here, now I want you to think about what it means, because it's not just a number. Every, ten, every 20 minutes, every 20 minutes, a person dies of an overdose from a prescription opioid. Every 20 minutes. So from the moment I start to the moment on air, I end, one person will be afflicted by something that should have not happened. And when we have a situation like this, a crisis like this, that as was said before, it can affect, it's affecting everyone, all ages, all change, genders, all socioeconomic classes, people that have never been addicted to, a, 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 some, to anything, people that have been addicted to drugs, everyone is vulnerable to becoming addicted. And this prescription opioid has made that evident. When we have such a crisis, we cannot justify inaction. We know how to fix it. Improve education, provide an infrastructure, provide treatment to pain to those that need it, provide treatment for opioid use disorder to those that need it, and do prevention. The challenge, like anything else, well, I shouldn't say like anything else, because in some instances, I always like to say like Alzheimer's. I don't know how I would start with addressing right now the Alzheimer's epidemic. But in this case, we know how to address the prescription opioid epidemic. But the challenge here is not the lack of knowledge. The challenge is the implementation. And I think we all in the healthcare system have a responsibility to do it. It's not a choice, it's a responsibility to do it. We created the prescription opioid epidemic, and we are there to cure and to decrease suffering. So we owe to actually control this epidemic. It's pretty straightforward. She says, hey, we know how to fix this. This is one of those things we know how to do. But people have to have access to care. We've got to try to reduce the stigma. We have to make it such that we treat this like a chronic condition. So, you know, imagine that, you know, for any of you who have hypertension or diabetes or asthma, what would happen if you went into your primary care provider and they say, oh, guess what? Um, you know what? We can't provide you this any longer because the insurance company says, You've been on it too long. And that's what happens. So we know that there are some things that we can do. She mentioned prevention. She mentioned access to care. She mentioned stigma. Disparities as well. So what we're doing about it. So the CDC came up with some opioid prescribing uh, guidelines, when to initiate their, their use, which opioids to, that, that are most you know, effective or most appropriate uh, for certain conditions, and assessing the risk that an individual might have in terms of developing uh, uh, an addiction. Educational initiatives. We know that if we talk to young kids, if we you know, uh, let people know about the risks involved in using opioids for a protracted period of time, we know we can dissuade them from doing so. We've done it with cigarettes. We've done an incredible job with cigarettes. Yeah, 
Try lighting up a cigarette around, you know, a 10-year-old these days, okay? If they don't jump you and pull it out of your face, okay, they're going to tell you why you shouldn't be doing that. And they're going to say, get that away from me. I mean, it's we know that. We see in New York City, they're, they're looking to, again, raise the tax on, on a pack of cigarettes to something like over 12 bucks a pack. I, I just like, wow, I'm glad I don't smoke. Here, they're only six bucks, but you know, we can, we can catch up. Um, comprehensive, this is the CARE Act. So this is really what, what we're looking at. And what I mentioned earlier is uh, uh, in terms of improving our drug monitoring systems, improving systems to where we can be able to track individuals who are getting multiple prescriptions, but also improve the healthcare, improve the network of healthcare providers and make it such that people don't have to go to a specialty clinic in order to get their issues, their, their, their substance use dependence issues sort of addressed. You can go to a primary care provider. That would be a great thing. You know, Beth showed that slide that like only 47% of the people who were discharged from, from treatment programs actually got HIV test, you know, tested. I thought that was kind of appalling. It's like only 40, that's, that's every single person should be HIV tested, should be HI, HCV tested. There's no reason why half of the people who are entered the, that system shouldn't be tested. I go to my primary care provider, I have no risks associated with HIV or HCV, and yet every a annual physical that I go, they test me. That's how it should be. In terms of implementation of overdose education and naloxone distribution programs, uh, there's some really good, you know, the ADAPT Pharmaceuticals, and I'll, uh, you know, it, ADAPT Pharmaceuticals has agreed to provide naloxone, the antidote for heroin overdose, to every high school and to every university in the nation free of cost. That's phenomenal. Uh, aggressive law enforcement, you know, really to address doctor shopping and those and the and the and the pill mills. We're seeing more and more crackdown on that. Uh, instead of sending people to jail, you know, get them into treatment. And for those people who are in prison systems, providing them with care such that they can work on their their recovery when they're in custody, and that there are transitional sort of measures in place for when they're released back to the community. That's ideal, that's really what we want. They're looking at you know, taking individuals who were opioid dependent when they went into a prison system and either putting them onto methadone or putting them onto Suboxone upon release and reducing that potential for overdose. Because the fact is, is that we know that the people who are most at risk for overdosing are people who are coming out of prison who have an opioid, you know, a, a history of opioid use, but also individuals who are coming out of a detox or uh, are, are, are tapering off of uh, opiates. Those are the people most likely and most at risk uh, for an overdose. And an expansion of access to medication-assisted uh, 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 treatment and abuse deterrent formulations. We saw, you know, with OxyContin, the abuse deterrent formulations there. Those we see have been, have proven to be effective. Now, in terms of, you know, our, our history of, of treatment of substance use disorders isn't really that long. So in, in the 60s, based on some of the work by Dole and Nicewander, methadone was approved. In 74, methadone treatments, and this was really under the, the, you know, the, the Nixon administration, there was more and more uh, use of, of, uh, of OTPs you know, across the nation to address the uh, heroin use uh, uh, epidemic there. Uh, in 1984, you know, naltrexone was approved, but you know, we couldn't give it away. Interesting, we could not give, give it away, and when we could give it away, it was, that was when naltrexone was a pill only and you'd take it Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, like 100 milligrams on Monday, 100 milligrams on Wednesday, and 150 on Friday to hold you over the weekend. We couldn't give that medication away, and then the medication compliance was really an issue because people didn't want to take it. 
So that, that was really what prompted the advent of, of, the, uh, of Vivitrol. In 93, Leva alpha acetylmethadol uh, was, was approved. Um, it's a long-acting narcotic. It's not long-acting methadone. Uh, usually either three times a week dosing or twice a week dosing, very similar in its properties to, uh, to methadone. It would keep people from going into withdrawals. Uh, it was pulled from the market, you know, um, uh, by Roxanne Labs in 2003, primarily because they weren't making enough money from it. I mean, that was, it, it just wasn't, uh, it wasn't something that was, I think the, as, as the slide mentioned, 5,000 people was, was the maximum that they had across the nation on it. In 2002, uh, 2000, the Drug Addiction Treatment Act, the Data Act, which allowed for the expansion of uh, the use of buprenorphine into, uh, into, into physicians, uh, 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 physicians or primary care providers. NIDA, uh, launched its, in 2001, launched its prescription opioid heroin abuse in, initiative and really started taking a look at that. They recognized that there were some issues, you know, based on some of the epidemiology work that was coming in and some of the surveys that were coming in. They recognized that there was a problem, you know, with, with opiates at that point in time or fairly early on. Uh, in 2002, uh, Subutex, uh, or sub uh, uh, Subutex and Suboxone were approved uh, by the FDA. And uh, in 2004, Orlam, or LAM, was, was discontinued. Uh, it actually got the black box. The FDA gave it a black box, and so people really quit, quit using it at that point in time. And then in 2016, one of the most recent things is the implantable version of buprenorphine. Uh, it's... Um, uh, it, you know, it was was just recently improved. It's uh, uh, it's like Norplant. You know, the and it lasts six months. It's a small surgical procedure. They place it under the under the arm. Um, unfortunately, it's not biodegradable. Biodegradable. That's really the next sort of the next medication that'll probably be coming out as a biodegradable, uh, long-acting version of uh, of buprenorphine. Now, I mentioned a whole bunch of medications, but really, you know, when we talk about recovery, recovery isn't just about medications. Beth mentioned a number of the medication, a number of the behavioral treatments, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but if you take a look at this, this was developed um, uh, 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 out of the um, uh, Duke University. I'll think of the guy's name. It's, it's one of those Alzheimer things that I got going on, but... Um, I'll think of the, the, the researcher's name. They developed this, this grid or this, really to show what are all of the components of a recovery and what should go into it. So we're talking about family services and child services, vocational services, mental health as well as physical health, educational services, really addressing a lot of the different areas that in fact are addressed in the ASAM criteria uh, the, to develop an individual's recovery across many dimensions of, of, their, of their life. So it includes treatment planning and continuing care. You know, where we know that, well, maybe somebody doesn't have to remain in residential care for the rest of their life, it's going to be important for them to develop a recovery that includes community support that includes family support to help them to continue their recovery. And so when I talk about medications, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of medications, but medications by themselves don't do it. That's why we need you guys. That's why you know the, the, the things that you do in your community by working in an individual, working with families, you're saving lives. And that's critically important because if we didn't have you, you know, for the most part, uh, these issues wouldn't be addressed. And so, I, you know, I, I thank you. You know, we, we always thank people for their service. I want to thank you guys for your service and, and, the, and the efforts that you do. NIDA produced a, uh, it's called Principles of Drug Addiction Treatment, and there are 13 principles. And these are just some of the, these are the 13 principles. It's a complex but treatable disease that affects brain function. Uh, no single treatment is appropriate for anybody. Treatment needs to be readily available so that when somebody needs it, you know, I, you know, they pick up the phone, they make the call, and they say, oh, okay, yeah, 
uh, I'm going to put you on the waiting list, and in 90 days, we'll, we'll be able to get you in. What happens in 90 days? Yeah, I mean, it's like you know, it's, they, they forget. They forget about what it was that they made that phone call. The fact is, is that we need to be make, making treatment available to individuals when they're ready to, you know, to, to participate. Effective treatment attends to multiple needs, not just the drug use. The drug use is just one aspect of it. You know, we talked about the mental health condition. We talked about housing. You know, we talked about the trauma, you know, and the things that have gone on. These are things that need to be addressed, among others. Uh, you know, the idea that somebody's going to get out of prison who has no vocational or educational skills, and we put them back into the community with no vocational or educational skills, what do we expect them to do? The fact is that they're going to go back to doing some of the same things that they did in order to earn a living, in order to be able to survive in that community, unless we can provide them those resources. Remaining in treatment for an adequate period of time is critical. Okay? So my hypertension, you know, it's, it's like my goal today is to not drive home down Beverly. Okay, why is that? Huh? Tommy's Burgers, okay? I love Tommy's Burgers. All right, and I like Tommy's Burgers with extra chili. I'll even get chili and some cheese on my fries too, right? It's a good thing we've already eaten. But my goal, if, if I've been successful today, I won't have driven down Beverly and I won't have stopped. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's not, my hypertension isn't just about today. My hypertension is about eating right, getting exercise, watching my sodium intake. Right? And that's going to go on forever. And that's what somebody's recovery should do, is go on forever. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be in a residential program forever, but there has to be, we have to help them develop a recovery that addresses aspects of their life over the course of their lifetime. Behavioral therapies, including individual, family, group counseling, are the most commonly used form of drug treatment. You know, in Vietnam, when you go, when an individual shows up for at a, at a methadone program, unless they have their family with them, they can't get in. Okay? Unless they have their family with them, they can't get in. That's why they do such a great job. They do a remarkable job of, of getting people oriented to their, to their family, getting people part of becoming part of the community, getting them to reduce their drug addiction. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Something should be done about that because we're talking about critical. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do? So, so it, it you know, um, so the the what do we do about sort of our waiting lists? You know, in other parts of the in other parts of the state, there's some different issues. So. Here in, in Los Angeles, we have a lot of resources, but we have a lot of people waiting for those resources in a waiting list. In other parts of the state, more rural areas, they don't have those resources, and so they have to send somebody to another county in order to get those. What the county is doing under the direction of Dr. Gary Sy, and it's, it's really a, it's a, it's a good thing, um, and, and implementing through the ODS, the Organized Delivery System, is making it such that we can create opportunities for individuals to enter the treatment system at depending upon medical necessity, depending upon the level of severity that they need, so that not everybody gets referred to or gets admitted to a residential program for 90 days. Because what we know is that people who enter a residential program progress at different rates. Somebody might be doing really well after two or three weeks, 
and have a you know have a place to go to and and be able to step down into an intensive outpatient program or an outpatient program and continue the recovery there where somebody might need a longer period of time. What we have right now are program sort of driven treatment plans, program driven plans where I have a 90 day program, you come in, you're gonna stay here 90 days regardless of whether you do well or not. And so part of that system is, and, and I really appreciate sort of how Dr. Sai and, and his team are approaching that, is, is providing an individual the care that they need at that moment, assessing them periodically, and I mean assessing them periodically over a period of time such that when they're, when it, the determination is made, we can step them down and make room for another person to come into treatment. And the availability of outpatient services are going to be extended for as long as that individual needs it, not based on a time frame. So ideally, that's what we'd really like to happen. And I think, I think everybody's with you on that and recognizes that that's, that's a system challenge. And hopefully this new system will address that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Susan. Hey. Um, so I noticed earlier in the slides it was talking about the, the rates of women who reported um, experiencing sexual or physical abuse. Mm -hmm previously or childhood, whatever, um, that's just who reported, right? We're not talking about people who don't report, but when you look, when you, it struck me when you were talking about, you know, in Vietnam, the family needs to come along, or this emphasis on family therapy, when you have people who've been self-medicating because they've never talked about abuse in their family systems, whether it was against them or witnessing violence, yeah. against, violence against a parent or a sibling, and then you bring these people in, and then you, you want to talk about group therapy where your whole life is built on protecting these basically perpetrators. Right. That seems like it's a recipe for failure, not treatment success. Well, so it, it certainly it worked in Vietnam. How it's going to work here is it potentially could open up a whole different sort of area, uh, an area of challenges and violence. And, and violence. So it may be, and understand this, that person may not want to be. They may not want to have their family included in that process. And that's if that person chooses not to include their family in that process, that's entirely up to them. In Vietnam, it wasn't that way, and it seemed to work out fairly well. But your point is, is very well taken, is you know, when we bring the family in, all of a sudden, our challenges become exponential. Now what do we do? However, you know, certainly what we see with adolescents is it, we really do need to bring the family in because more often than not, it might be that there's family members who need care, who need treatment, and if we can get them concurrent treatment, that's probably, it's probably a better thing. But yeah, I think, these, I, I think the challenges that you, that you mentioned, I think, are going to be difficult. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Like between the mental health community, yeah, the, the providers mm -hmm. and the substance abuse and the medical community, right? And the clients get caught get get caught in the mix and they fall through the cracks and they're the ones who suffer the consequences yeah. and we're left there to pick up the pieces and so this is. I'm not hearing this in the message that you're bringing to us, then I think something that needs to be also discussed. Right. So, so you're, so the, 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 um, uh, he mentioned that really what we're talking about are mental health issues. We're talking about substance use issues. And we're also talking about primary care issues and the integration of, of, of all three of those things. Ideally, and, and I think this is where our system, this is the direction that our system is going, is to include all of those. I don't know which BART clinic you work at, but certainly I know BART Beverly has mental health. They have, they have counselors who, who are mental health trained. They have a primary care uh, sort of, uh, they have a primary care clinic there, there as well, and they address the substance use issues. The fact of the matter is, is that these things have been siloed for years and years and years, and that is a problem. And I think what we're going to see moving forward is 
the incorporation of the communication between primary care, between mental health, and between the delivery of substance use services. We're seeing more and more uh, substance use counselors being embedded into primary care settings. We're seeing uh, FQHCs like Clinica Sierra Vista and Ultimed now having a behavioral health component along with the substance use component. These are absolutely, these are things that need to be addressed concurrently because it's no longer the time when, you know, I have a client and I want to get in mental health services. I sent them to a mental health facility and they tell me, look, get them drug free for 90 days and then we'll be able to address his mental health issues. Well, the fact is, is if I could have been able to get him drug free for 90 days, I'd, I'd do that. But it may be that the mental health issues that he's facing or she's facing are keeping me from, or keeping him from getting drug free. So absolutely, it has to be a comprehensive sort of uh, uh, a system. And I think that that previous slide that we talked about that addressed, you know, many, many aspects of an individual life, maybe I didn't articulate that very well, but I think it fits right into what, hopefully what you were, what you were thinking that it should. Um, medications are an important element of treatment for many, pa many patients, especially when combined with counseling and other behavioral therapies. To continue this, an individual's treatment and service plans must be assessed continually, modified as necessary, and meet his or her changing needs. Certainly what we have to do is incorporate our client's input into the development of a treatment plan and address the treatment plan with them at every single individual session that we have. It, a treatment plan isn't to be developed and then put into the chart so that a monitor can come and look and make sure that we have a treatment plan. The treatment plan should be something that a client agrees to, that a client participates in the development, that the client recognizes, hey, this is my problem, this is my long-term goal. Hey, let's come up with some options as to how we can address those things. And so those client-driven plans are going to be crucially important here. Many drug-addicted individuals have other mental health disorders. And more often than not, they do. It's, it's not a day that, that when, we've, when we've worked with clients that, that we recognize that they don't have mental health issues regardless of whether those were you know, trauma-related or whether those are things that they've had for a significant period of time or have, have developed rec more recently. Medically-assisted detox really is only the first part of this, the first stage of this. And in fact, what we do know is that, you know, uh, uh, Tom's, one of Tom's and, and Beth's and my mentor says, you know, detox is good for a lot of things, but keeping people off drugs isn't one of them. Okay, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, is that getting somebody drug free doesn't really do anything other than put them at greater risk for relapse and potential overdose. Well, I, I, certainly by itself. And what we what we see with, uh, you know, the you know, the, the data that with uh, uh, the rapid detoxes, we see that people are, are more likely to, you know, to relapse uh, and, and experience uh, uh, overdoses. In terms of you know, withdrawal management, withdrawal management needs to be part of a comprehensive model of care. And so in and of itself, detox isn't gonna do anything, but withdrawal management as part of a comprehensive program can be effective. Does, I hope that, yeah, okay, good. Treatment doesn't need to be voluntary to be effective. We know that. I mean, we know that sometimes when, you know, a spouse is grinding the ax in the corner and, you know, and, and tells the person, hey, you know, get into treatment or else, we know that can be effective. We also know that people, you know, coerce treatment uh, episodes are incredibly effective. You know, what we, what the goal is, is to use some of those MI techniques to develop that sort of internal, that intrinsic motivation to help somebody ultimately make changes to their, to their life. 
So we know that it can be effective. We also know that contingency management can be effective. Paying somebody to not use is, works really well. We know contingency management is effective. But the fact is, is that we have our own stigma against doing that. You know, about paying people for providing a clean UA result. Hey, you know, it's a lot less than, as you'll see, putting them in jail. Drug use during treatment must be monitored continuously. And lastly, treatment programs should test for HIV, AIDS, hepatitis B and C, tuberculosis, other infectious disease, and link the individuals to the treatment that's necessary to address those. All right. So behavioral treatments, uh, CBT, matrix, motivational interviewing, contingency management, seeking safety, DBT, there are a lot of very effective treatments out there, okay? And as Beth mentioned, you can go to your NREP site and look at some of those things. Uh, ACT, ACT, Brief Strategic Family Therapy, these are some incredibly effective treatments that are available. And when they're combined with medications can be uh, even that much more effective. Now here's the FDA approved medications. Naltrexone, methadone, buprenorphine, and buprenorphine naloxone, which is suboxone. Okay, these are, these are the FDA approved medications. Now this is a little bit complicated, but all, all I want you to focus on is the red line, the blue line, and the black line, okay? Are we good? <laughs> the black line is heroin, okay? And basically what happens is you use enough heroin and you quit breathing, period. End of, end of story. This is fentanyl. You use less fentanyl and you quit breathing. Basically that's, that's till death. Till death do you part. Now if you look at, and that's where uh, total apnea right there. The red line, the dotted red line is death, all right? Now, if you look at the blue line, the blue line is buprenorphine. And that's what I was talking about is that ceiling effect of buprenorphine is it has a, a relatively high safety profile. The more you use, the less effect you get. So basically, there's a ceiling effect on it, so it's a protective factor. Whereas with other opiates, with opiates, okay, such as fentanyl, such as morphine, such as heroin, the more you use, the greater the likelihood you're going to overdose. That's why, that's the real value of using Suboxone in terms of uh, medication-assisted uh, therapy. We're going to talk a little bit about extended relief naltrexone right now. One of the really good things about the extended release naltrexone is that it takes away the opportunity for an individual to quit taking the medication, all right? And they don't have to make a decision every single day about taking that pill or three times a week. They get the shot in the butt once, you know, once a month, and they're, and they're good for that period of time. It's used both for uh, the treatment of, of alcohol uh, use disorder as, as well as for uh, opioid use disorder. It's one injection, it's, it hurts. I haven't had it, but I've, I've seen it administered and it hurts. It's a thick needle, the solution is viscous. They need to make sure that they take it out of the refrigerator so that uh, it's not like, you know, shooting, uh, shooting uh, uh, you know, ice into your, into your butt or anything like that, but, but so, uh, it has to be warmed up and, you know, and, and to room temperature and then injected. It's every four weeks. They usually rotate. They, they put it in one, one side uh, one month and then they switch sides because, you know, it, it's, it's that painful. However, it, uh, it works really, it works incredibly well. It works like oral naltrexone, which, is, which is, can be taken uh, on a daily basis. It blocks opioid receptors uh, from opiates attaching themselves to that receptor and being absorbed into the system uh, for, for, you know, for a period of 28 to 30 days. And it is very effective. It's incredibly effective. People say, well, what about taking it out? Can't somebody remove it? Yeah, it's, it hasn't been done. And it probably won't be done. I mean, it would, you know, in terms of... Uh, uh, removing it, Nobody, there have been no documented, you know, sort of efforts to do that. 
what about somebody you know who gets into a car accident? Well, they can they can provide a, an individual relief either with opioids or with uh, non-opioid uh, an analgesics. It's not addictive. Okay, so naltrexone, either in pill form or Vivitrol, it's it's not addictive. You don't find there's no street value for it. People aren't you know out jonesing for naltrexone or you know or or Vivitrol, not not by any means. Okay, it, there's no withdrawal associated with it. What's fascinating though about this thing, when we did some of the early placebo-controlled trials using the tablets, and we did those at Sepulveda VA Hospital and a number of the VA hospitals throughout the nation, one of the things that, and, and when it was a blinded trial, so the staff, the research staff, nor the patients knew what the individual was getting. One of the things that we found that was most remarkable was the craving went way down on individuals who were actually on the real medication versus those who were on the placebo. That was something that we didn't anticipate. And so that's a really good, so to speak, side effect of, of the medication is that a person's craving goes down. And what we saw were individuals would test it. People say, okay, I'm gonna go I'm gonna go try it. And they would use on top of it, and in fact it would block the block the effects of the medication. The medication right now costs, uh, we have $1,100. I did a little bit more research on it. It's closer to $1,300 right now in terms of that. Los Angeles County is one of the few counties in the nation that really has an initiative to provide for, um, uh, to for, provide for the, the uh, administration of, uh, of uh, Vivitrol, both for alcohol and for opiates. When compared to placebo, uh, extended release, this, this work was done in, in Russia, believe it or not, by uh, Evgeny uh, Kropinski, and he worked with George Woody at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, but individuals uh, who received extended release naltrexone had fewer opioid positive uh, tests. They stayed in treatment longer. And as we know, retention is the name of the game here. I mean, the longer we can keep people in treatment, the better chance that we have to help them to reach ultimately reach their goals. They had less craving, and they showed greater improvement in, in the, the mental component of their quality of life. And that's really what, what the FDA is looking at now uh, in terms of evaluation of, of, their, uh, of their research, and, and, and whether it's blinded studies or placebo-controlled studies. What they're looking at is quality of life, moreover than just does somebody stop using altogether. It used to be that it was total abstinence. Now what the FDA is looking at was, hey, do the people recognize or do they value sort of how their life has improved since they've either reduced their drug use or stopped using altogether? So extended release naltrexone, it has advantages and disadvantages. So if you're paying for it on your own, a disadvantage is the cost. Patient compliance is, you know, in, in terms of a disadvantage, yeah, patient compliance. They can just quit showing up. They can just quit coming back. So, you know, compliance could be an issue there. But they don't have to make that decision every single day. They have to make it once a month. They have to be opioid-free in order to get on to naltrexone, okay? They have to be opioid-free. If a person has opiates on board and they take naltrexone, either in pill form or in terms of Vivitrol, they will go into immediate withdrawals. The reason being is naltrexone, either in Vivitrol or the pill form, binds more tightly to the opiate receptors. And so what it'll do, if there's opiates on those receptors, it'll go in, it'll wipe them clean, it'll move it off, and it'll put the person in withdrawals. So they have to be opiate-free in order to be inducted onto naltrexone or Vivitrol. Suboxone as well, but we'll, we'll get to that. It's not dependence producing. There's no associated withdrawal. So if somebody stops taking it, they're, they're not going to experience any physical or psychological withdrawals. We know it reduces craving. It's covered by insurance, which is really a good thing. Um, and it's one per, you know, once per month dosing, which is, a, which is good as well. Uh, now, Trexone for o opioid overdose. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that. It's used, so it's called naloxone. My mistake, it's naloxone, Narcan. 
Narcan and naloxone are one and the same. I hope I didn't confuse you. Naltrexone is the long-acting version. Narcan and naloxone are the short-acting versions. All right? Now, it's used to counteract life-threatening depression of the central nervous system and respiratory system. Has anybody ever seen naltrexone administered to somebody who is out? Naloxone. No, I'm sorry. Thank you. Naloxone. What did you see? Yeah. Thank you. It was almost like um, a defibrillator for cardiac arrest. You know, it was almost like the person literally came back to life. I couldn't believe it. Complete 180. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty remarkable. Get back. Go ahead. You had your hand up. Yeah, in the emergency room, uh, I I saw them. Uh, it wasn't a pretty picture. I saw them inject someone, and they almost popped up from the gurney, and they started crying. They said, you, you fucked up my high. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, the first time I was working at an OTP on the Central Coast, uh, somebody came in. Uh, we didn't give them their, their dose. We sat them down, had them evaluated. Next thing they were out, we called 911. They came. Gave him a shot. He sat up, and that was very, he was angry, very very angry. It's like you know, what are you doing to me? You know, and and uh, you know that is that is the general response. Um, it's not scheduled. You can actually any of us can actually go buy it. We can go to a pharmacy right now and buy it. As I mentioned, though, Adapt is providing it free of cost to high school high schools, and this is through the. Um, uh, the the uh, the Clinton Foundation. They came to an agreement. He, uh, all high schools and universities is going to be provided there. And then they have a, a well. I'm jumping ahead a little bit. It's not addictive. It works only if opioids are present. So if somebody, you know, if you think that 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 somebody needs it and it's administered, it only works if opioids are present. Period. So it's you're you're probably not going to do somebody harm unless they're uh, unless they're allergic to it. There's no abuse potential. Uh, it can be injected, or uh, then they have now intranasal uh, administration of it. It usually wears off in 20 to 90 minutes, as I mentioned before, which is which is good and bad. I mean, uh, the bad part is if somebody's taking fentanyl, you're going to have to re-administer that over a period of time. Uh, so again, uh, this is one of the more crude intranasal uh, administration devices. Uh, this is the Adapt Pharma. One that's, uh, that, that was recently approved. Uh, local and state government agency first responders can get it for 75 bucks, which is uh, for a dual pack. So it's like 37 bucks, uh, you know, 37.50 per. Um, without a prescription, we can go buy it for, you know, our family member wh who doesn't have uh, insurance can go buy it for, you know, 110 bucks. This other, this is um, the SVO. Uh, this is a, uh, an injector. This is the, the auto injector here. Uh, it contains one dose, four milligram dose. Um, can I have a volunteer? <laughs> oh, what's up? You, 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 can, you can inject me. You can, you, can, you can hit me with it. Come on. Really? Oh, my God. You guys are killing me. Okay. So this is it. I, I need somebody who hasn't seen this before. Come on up, come on up here. Okay, you can you can hit me with it. You don't have to do yourself. Okay. Have you ever seen this before? No. What oh, is that? Okay. So this is the this is the Esvio right there. That's what that is. Okay. So all right. So go ahead and just pull a pull the cap off of that right there. This trainer contains no needle or drug. Okay. Did you guys hear that? Okay. Now. If you are ready to. Go ahead. Go ahead. Stick it. Uh, can you see? All right. Come over here. Just stick, <laughs> stick it on my push hearts. No. That's it. That's it. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. So. Okay. So you haven't seen that before, right? Okay. So that's how simple that is. That's that's all it takes. Is in in terms of saving somebody's life, that's all there is. Now that's the value of something like this. However. Okay, so it's, you know, you still have to get somebody to emergency treatment. So once that's done, you still have to get them the additional care. Now, one of the things I don't really like about this company, okay, is that they raised the price to 4,500 bucks. Okay, so, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's tragic. That's what's happening, you know, in, a, in our country is you take something like this that can save somebody's life. Now it was probably 450 bucks before anyway, and you can see the, the value of something like that because it's remedial. Anybody can do this, but they raise it to 450 bucks. There's actually um, there there are actually some some sen they're looking into this administratively to see what can be done about it. But you can see how something like that can work. Now, in terms of law enforcement agencies, you know, carrying naloxone, we can see we really haven't done a great job here in California. There's only four agencies, you know, first responders who have it as of a year ago, you know, who are actually carrying this, you know, other than EMTs. They carry it all the time. But if you look at New York, New York had almost 200, you know, in terms of, you know, the first responders. I mean, that's where we should all be. I mean, people should have this. It should be made available. Good Samaritan overdose immunity laws, 37 states have Good Samaritan laws. So that if you were to try life-saving, you know, if you were to try to save somebody's life, you're not going to get sued for it. You know, and that's, and that's a good thing. So you can see the things that we're doing to address this is to be able to involve the community and make, make the life-saving uh, uh, precautions or life-saving uh, events more available. Get Naloxone Now is a website, okay? Uh, you can go on this website. They have a 20-minute uh, training uh, video where you can go on, assess whether or not somebody uh, has, is, uh, uh, has had an opioid overdose, whether they're responsive or not, and it tells you what to do. It'll walk you through that. I recommend that anybody that, that works you know, in and around individuals who... Um, use opiates, family members, go on to this website. It's free of cost. Uh, they give you a certificate at the end of it. It only takes about 20 minutes. It's really, really a good, uh, uh, a good tool. Okay, so, yes? On the apparatus that she used on you that was a trainer, does the actual dosage of people who want to see this in the field have the voice box as well? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Isn't it fascinating? That's pretty it's pretty. It's pretty cool. I mean, it, that's that's exact. That's exactly what you get. So, I mean, anybody can just if if we stop and we listen to sort of how this should be administered on the tape, we could save somebody's life through that. Now, the other thing though is if we go to this website, we can sort of learn about how to save somebody's life utilizing a very similar method, and that would be. So, for instance, the, the nasal inhaler, this, the, you know, by, that, that was developed by ADAPT. Same thing. Okay. Methadone. What do we think of methadone? What do you think? I know. Junkies. Junkies. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's like they're not in treatment, are they? Okay. What else? What, 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 I, let me put it to you like this. What is some of the stigma that you've heard as it relates to methadone? Substitute for heroin. Substitute for heroin, okay? Pardon me? Worse than heroin. What else? Some people, yeah. Some people, so in other words, some people might not have their, their dose properly adjusted, so they may be using not just heroin, but other, other drugs on top of it as well. Yeah, okay. What are some other things that you've said? You heard, not said. I'm sorry. A little faux pas there. Okay. All right. So, yeah, there's a huge stigma associated with it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some data. I'm going to show you some data. 
And this data is not new. This data is pretty old. So this is the number of programs that we have you know, nationwide, right around 1,500 uh, opioid treatment programs. You know what's interesting, though, is, is since methadone was approved, that system hasn't changed one iota. It's still the same. And I think that it really does need to change. It's a specialty clinic where, that, that, where there's silos. I really think that this kind of care, this life-saving care, needs to be incorporated more into the physical health system, more into primary care. So methadone, also called methadose or dolefine, um, it's used to discourage illipid, uh, illicit opioid use. It reduces an individual's craving. Uh, it was approved in 1964. It's really, you know, it, it's, it's an incredible pain reliever. So it's been, you know, uh, approved for the treatment of severe pain. Um, it's also uh, incredibly effective as a maintenance tool in terms of long-term use. Uh, for years and years and years, and it's still probably the case, you know, there were 21-day detoxes that uh, they'd bring an individual in, they would get their dose up to maybe 40 milligrams and then taper it over a period of, of 21 days. You know, they're, they're really not that effective. They're not, they're, you know, and I know that the, 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 the feds extended this out to six months. But, but what we know is that, you know, you usually cannot undo all those behavioral sort of things that go along with an addiction in 21 days. You usually can't undo those things in six months. And so we have to combine, it's really important to combine sort of behavioral therapy along with the medication so the person doesn't have to go out seeking drugs and we can address those other things concurrently. Pregnancy, it really is considered the gold standard you know, for uh, opiate users who uh, become become pregnant, uh, the the data is is really good in terms of uh, the outcomes, in terms of uh, 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 the prenatal outcomes uh, for for individuals who who deliver under the uh, uh, who who are currently being maintained and monitored uh, on methadone. Um, it's. Uh, the detoxification generally from either heroin or from methadone uh, is generally contraindicated. If somebody is going to be uh, tapered or withdrawn from methadone, it's usually the, the second trimester, not the first or the, uh, or the third. But moreover, there are uh, indications that you should maintain the individual on as low a dose as possible to keep them from experiencing you know, withdrawal symptoms and putting the, the fetus you know, uh, uh, in distress, uh, maintain them. Uh, there's indications to allow the mother to breastfeed during that period of time to, you know, to, uh, uh, to allow for the bonding process to take place. And there's relatively um, minimal, uh, usually distress experienced by, uh, by the baby, though they do use uh, paragoric as a measure to you know, help the individual, uh, the, the baby who might be in some, some distress. Methadone binds to the same receptor sites as, as, as other opioids, including heroin and, and, uh, and morphine. It's orally effective. It's usually in a, in a tablet form that's, that's crushed up and liquefied, or it's a liquid, uh, liquid form that they add water to it. It has a slower onset of action, usually lasts about 24 hours in terms of its duration, and withdrawals usually begin uh, usually about 24 hours when an individual uh, would, and when I say withdrawals, they may feel a little sense of discomfort, but we're not talking full-blown withdrawals at, at about a 24-hour period. They recognize that their dose is, is beginning to, to wane and taper off. Uh, advantages, it uh, suppresses opioid withdrawals and reduces craving. Uh, it's you know, orally administered. Once daily enables an individual to you know, go about their responsibility. Uh, when it's combined with counseling, it can be incredibly effective. Uh, reduce crime, reduce transmission of bloodborne uh, viruses, and there's really few long-term side effects. We recently completed a, uh, a trial comparing um, Suboxone, 
uh, versus uh, methadone for six month period on liver function, and they were both uh, they they both really showed that. Uh, individuals that, that there wasn't any worsening of liver function, there wasn't any additional challenge on individuals uh, in terms of their liver function tests, uh, unless they initially came in and they had a compromised uh, compromised system. So these are this is like the uh, the advantage. So this is the uh, the half life or the the life of of painkillers and, uh, and heroin. As you can see, uh, a person would need to re-administer every four to six hours uh, over the course of their day. Uh, for, for methadone, um, you can see that a person would need to administer once, generally once every 24 hours. So the disadvantage is that dependence is maintained. I mean, and that's, so a person will continue to be opioid dependent while they, while they continue to be maintained on, on methadone. Uh, withdrawal, like any other opiate, withdrawal from any other opiate or opioid can be incredibly difficult. Um, it, it, there's a commitment. There really is a commitment. The person initially going on to a program has to attend the clinic generally every day and then earn steps to uh, be able to get medication to take home uh, over the course of, well, usually it's, it's uh, 90 days to get one take home, six, six months you know, drug-free and engaged in educational or vocational activities uh, to get an, uh, a second take home and, and so on. Diversion is, is an issue. Uh, it can be an issue. Uh, the, the, the street value of methadone is usually about a, a dollar a milligram, and so we do see that there is some, some diversion of it. Um, it's a safe medication. Uh, the side effects are, again, nausea, some nausea and constipation, but generally the, the, the nausea is a little less severe, though constipation uh, uh, is, is an issue and one of the significant side effects that individuals on methadone uh, have. Uh, they don't recognize that there's any, any disruption in sort of cognitive functioning, uh, and there's really no organ damage that has been uh, associated with it. Lots of times people say, oh, I've gained a lot of weight. Well, there's, there's reasons that generally people, they become more sedentary when they're on, you know, when they're on methadone. Their eating habits uh, change significantly. Uh, they're a lot less active sometimes when they're on methadone. So these are some things that, that have to be addressed behaviorally. Generally, a dose of 60 milligrams or more is, is most effective. For the longest time, there were some states like Oklahoma that had a ceiling of like 40 milligrams and couldn't figure out why nobody stopped using heroin when they were on their program. And, and primarily is because they were, they, the, the doses were, were really uh, inadequate. So this is just some of the data. As you can see, this, this is old data and it hasn't changed. This is one of the reasons why we show this stuff to you is because it's been around for such a long period of time, and yet we still have that stigma associated. As you can see, you know, between 60 and 80 milligrams, uh, IV drug use drops down significantly. It drops down considerably. Now, in terms of length of time, uh, as you can see, the longer somebody stays in treatment, the better they do. And what, that, what we do during that period of time is work on those behavioral aspects. We work on, you know, having them, helping them to identify triggers, helping them to identify relationships that are detrimental to their recovery, getting them back involved with their family system and a, de develop a support system if, in fact, that is something that would be useful, having them, helping them develop a community recovery, getting them to meetings you know, getting them engaged in educational and vocational activities. So these are things that you do while an individual or you help an individual do while they're being maintained on, on methadone. In terms of crime, this is, so, I mean, this is pretty dramatic. In terms of the number of crime days, as you can see, these are uh, six different programs across the United States. This is Ball and Ross, and this was done in 1991. And you can see the, 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 the difference in crime rate. This is before treatment, and these, this is 250 days of uh, you know, crime days. This is after treatment. That's pretty significant. 
when you when you when you think about sort of the impact that it reduces we know it reduces heroin use it also reduces crime days which is which is important it also reduces hiv rates because we're reducing needles you know we're reducing the uh, the 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 need for an individual to to use needles and 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 to use heroin to, and to share needles uh, so if if um, if you take a look at this, so this is relapse to IV use after the termination of treatment. Now, so this this little bracket that you see right there should actually extend from one, two, and three out to ten to twelve. These are months across the bottom. This is in treatment. Yeah, you know, a small a percentage of people are continuing to use uh, intravenous uh, heroin while they're in treatment. And here at that point in time. Uh, by Ball and Ross, it was just under 30%, okay? Now, what you have to remember, though, is that most people, when they come into treatment, are using six-plus times a day. So this may be that, yeah, they're, that, that, that they're showing up, that they're positive on a drug screen. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily using six times a day, but ultimately that only 28% only of them are using intravenously, while the other 70% 70, 70 aren't using at all, which is pretty significant. After treatment, it went up to 45%, uh, one to three months, four to, four to six months, 57. 10 to 12 months out, 82% of the people return to illicit drug use. Mortality rates in and out of treatment, uh, it's, it's about 1% in treatment, 8% uh, out of treatment. So we know that it's, it, it's saving lives. Um, very complicated. What I'm going to show you here is this is in treatment and the cost. So for outpatient drug-free treatment, uh, we're looking at uh, about $117 a month. That was in 2000. I know it's a lot more than that. Residential therapeutic was about $300 a month. Methadone maintenance, 406, that was in 2003 per month. Outpatient drug three, 361. Uh, residential uh, treatment uh, in 2003 was $2,500. Now, if you compare that to crime, uh, and this is crime in, from the criminal justice system, per crime, for a nonviolent offense, just for the crime alone was sixteen hundred bucks. A violent offense was seven thousand dollars. Okay, just for the crime alone. Now, if you add the arrest in there, you add for a drug offense, it was an additional seven thousand dollars. For a nonviolent offense, it was seven thousand dollars. For a violent offense, it was ten thousand dollars. And then you add twenty-three hundred a month for incarceration. So the comparison is huge. Now, here, just in California, the comparison uh, when we had Prop 36 going, the cost of treatment was $4,500 versus $27,000. And that, now there's no guarantee either way. There's no guarantee that a person in treatment's going to get well. But just the same way, there's no guarantee that incarcerating somebody's going to get well. But what we do know is if we can keep people in treatment, Ultimately, they're going to do better than if we just keep them in jail. Okay, questions or comments? We good so far? We're on the home stretch, I promise. Buprenorphine naloxone. So, this is one of your quiz questions, remember? Okay, so it produces a ceiling effect at higher doses. Usually, an average dose is about 16 milligrams. The highest dose that anybody would get is 32 milligrams. That's usually about the highest dose that somebody would get. It binds really strongly to those opiate receptor sites. So again, like naltrexone, in order to induct somebody onto buprenorphine, either buprenorphine or suboxone, they have to be in withdrawals. They have to have a, a COWS, a clinical opioid withdrawal scale of 12 or more. It's kind of like, you know, when you invite somebody over for dinner and dinner's late, it's like no matter what you put out in front of them, they're going to like it. You know, it tastes really good. Well, that's what you want to do with somebody when you want to put them on to buprenorphine is you want to starve them. You want them to be in a little bit of distress and then give them the buprenorphine. They're going to feel a lot better. 
if they have the opiates on board and it's a short time after, usually we tell them, look, we, we don't want you to use 24 hours before you come in to get a, you know, inducted onto Suboxone or Buprenorphine. But if they, somebody comes in and they've used six hours before, we won't put them on because what will happen is it will put them in dress. In, in, um, they'll, they'll, they'll go into withdrawals. And so because um, so, what happens is the buprenorphine is going to come in and remove the opiates from the, the, and put them into withdrawals. Distress was the word. All right, uh, that one we removed. So research, it's, uh, so there's a lot of research that's gone on. We did liquid tablet comparison. We compared it to methadone at, 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 at different doses. Um, before it was approved, over 5,000 patients had been uh, exposed to buprenorphine. It, uh, we compared it to placebo. Of course, you know, compared to placebo, it works incredibly well. Uh, we compared it to methadone. Uh, usually, the higher doses of uh, methadone do better than the, than the higher doses of buprenorphine, especially you know, for individuals who have uh, experience with methadone. They seem to do better uh, on that. There's a, there's a study called the START Retention Study. I didn't, I didn't uh, address it here. But it takes a look at uh, reasons for discharge for people on Suboxone versus people on methadone. So it's marketed uh, in the US, uh, the buprenorphine naloxone. It discourages IV use. That's what they combine the naloxone with it because in France, people were injecting buprenorphine uh, and they were, they were injecting it and using combinations of benzos with it. So there were a lot of overdose related deaths to that, uh, associated with that. So the FDA said, look, if you're gonna, we're gonna get approval here, we want you to include it with the naloxone so that it doesn't get injected, so it can't be injected. Because um, when, when, when suboxone is injected, the naloxone takes effect. And remember what naloxone does? It's the antidote for opioid overdose. It comes in and it completely removes the opiates from the system. Uh, it diminishes diversion. So uh, there's a lot less diversion of it. Uh, it. It now comes in a film strip and also a sublingual version. Uh, it allows for take-home do dosing. So you can actually go to your physician and see your physician and, and get this, uh, get a prescription for it, and then work on the behavioral things with a, you know, a counselor or your physician or uh, a psychologist. Uh, and it has, again, a, a relatively high safety profile. It's unusual that somebody would overdose from buprenorphine uh, in and of itself. Some of the disadvantages. It maintains opioid dependence. Okay, so there are withdrawals associated with it. Ab absolutely, we, we've seen that. It allows for diversion in some ways. Uh, what we see, you know what we are seeing in the prison system is that they would take it and stick it behind uh, the stamps and attach it. And then so when people would get mail, they would pull it off and they would be able to use it uh, uh, in, in, the, in the prison system. Withdrawal like withdrawal from any other opiates can be, can be incredibly difficult. Uh, it requires daily or usually sometimes multiple times daily. And it costs probably about $300 a month to, uh, to get the prescription. This is the buprenorphine implant. That's what it looks like. It's one of those little rods. Usually there's about, it's produced by Brayburn uh, Pharmaceuticals. Usually there's four rods that they implant and it lasts for a period of six months. It's, it, it's amazing how well, you know, how well in fact it, uh, it does work. So the FDA, uh, in terms of the labeling for these things, the FDA says, look, if you're gonna use a medication, make sure that it's used in combination with behavioral therapies. It's not meant for the per just to give to the person and say, hey, you know, you're good to go, take care of your business. No, in fact, it should be used with behavioral therapies. The goal of treatment is holistic, so it should be integrated. We should include, as you mentioned, mental health, physical health, you should, you know, uh, vocational or occupational type therapies, uh, physical health as, as, as well as with this, so that we can get people back on the road to being part of society and being sort of significant contributors to society. 
Medications can help us take care of the physical, again, but we need you guys to help people develop a recovery. And without that, people aren't really going to get better. We know that they're going to improve upon, their condition is going to improve, but ultimately they're not going to develop a recovery. So uh, what's on the horizon? So this is a medication. This is um, uh, uh, an, an Orvinol analog. What they're trying to do is to help people um, that what they're trying to do is to develop an analgesic that doesn't have addictive properties. That's really cool. I mean, I think that's where we're going to go, hopefully in the future, is to develop a medication that we can get somebody out of distress for pain, but yet not, as, as Dr. Volkov, you know, not get them dependent upon that substance in the interim. Um, also, so in terms of uh, uh, buprenorphine, they're looking at ways to get people off of buprenorphine using a medication called memantine. And so what they, what they want to be able to do is to include buprenorphine and memantine. And based on this, what they're seeing is that, uh, so this is the, the, the red line is placebo. The uh, gold line here is memantine at uh, 15 milligrams, and the uh, uh, the blue line is memantine at 30 milligrams. And so what they're what they're seeing is that uh, they stop people uh, taking the buprenorphine at week nine. They stop the memantine at week 11. And what they see is that the people who have memantine at 30 milligrams have a reduced rate of, uh, of uh, opiate use at that period of time. So they're trying to use combinations of medication that are non-addictive to help support that withdrawal. And uh, ideally, that would be something that, that would be real positive, to help people facilitate getting off of, uh, off of these medications. This last one here um, are, is that uh, in terms of uh, uh, improving referrals, when people show up at... Uh, an emergency department room, what they do, uh, this one study here, they, they took uh, something like 1,300 cases. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and when people came in and they were drug-seeking for opiates or they recognized that these guys were opiate users, they gave them a dose of buprenorphine and a referral as opposed to just education uh, or just a referral and found that people were more likely to take the buprenorphine, be in less distress, and show up at the referral um, that they referred them to. That they, you know, so that's that's some of the things that people are thinking about in terms of advancing the science. Ultimately, shared decision making. This is a, a tool that's on the SAMHSA website. Ultimately, our clients have to be involved in this process. It really has to be a shared decision as to what direction that they go in order to receive care for their opioid dependence. This is a website I would recommend that you go to. It outlines some options that you can sit down and work with your clients on, on sort of different courses of action. Uh, certainly, shared decision making is really, uh, I, I think, where we always want to be in terms of addressing chronic disorders within our individuals, whether they're mental health, physical health, or substance use related. So where does this leave us? Opioids, hey, they've been around for 5,000 years. They're not going, anyway, going away any, anytime soon. We know that. Uh, dependence is treatable. Combination of behavioral and, and uh, behavioral therapies as well as medication is good. Um, we know that opioid users are most likely to uh, uh, to overdose following incarceration or detoxification. Uh, medications are effective, and we should work with our clients to figure out what's, what works best for them, what it is that they want in terms of what we dictate to them and what, uh, uh, what we think is ultimately best. So, all right, you ready? While opioids and opiates belong to the same family, they are derived by a different process, true or false? All right, here we go. Got one more? All right. 
So true. While opioids and, and opiates belong to the uh, same family, they are in fact uh, derived by a different process, okay? Next, opioids act as a or an partial agonist, full agonist, antagonist, or agnostic at the mu, kappa, and delta receptors. go. Full agonist is 51%. So full agonist. So I probably didn't really explain that as, as, as thoroughly as I probably could have. But that, so opioids act as, as a full agonist at the mu kappa and, and delta receptors. All right. Suboxone, buprenorphine acts as a partial agonist. Okay. Suboxone is a partial agonist. Opioids, including Vicodin, Oxy, is a full agonist. Naltrexone, naloxone, Vivitrol are antagonistic at the receptors. Okay. All right, next question. While the majority of the world's opium production is generated in Afghanistan, the majority of heroin coming into the United States comes from Mexico and South America. True or false? Okay, here we go. True, 93%. So that that's correct. Well, the majority, it, most of the most of the heroin coming in from the U.S. Uh, into the U.S. goes comes in from Mexico and South America. Good job. While persons who inject drugs account for a diminishing percentage of individuals diagnosed with HIV, injection drug use continues to present a significant risk factor. Okay, here, here we go. True, that, that's, that's correct. It's a diminishing pr uh, percentage, but in fact, it, it does uh, still contain a significant amount of risk uh, for, for HIV. Nice job. Okay, people generally get their prescription pain relievers for non-medical use from which of the following sources? Multiple doctors, a single doctor, from family or friends, from a drug dealer, or all of the above. That's correct. From family or friends, uh, that's that's the majority of them are generally getting it from uh, from family or friends. So with that, I want to thank you guys very much for your attention. Um, I especially I especially want to thank my volunteer for sticking me with this needle. I'll go get care afterwards. Please um, don't leave yet. Yeah. Uh, so, what do you guys think? What should we change? What should we keep? What should we give you a little less of? What should we give you a little more of? Well, can we take some questions just first? What, yes. I just have one question. I, okay. I just want to know the, in the part that you said, efforts to facilitate buprenorphine, buprenorphine's, uh, to taper off. Yes. What was the name of that drug? Memantine. How do you spell it? I'm going to put it right I just right want up. to make sure I have it right. It's M-E-M-A-N-T-I-N-E. -E. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Hi. Is that memantine the same one they use for Alzheimer's disease? Yes. Okay. And then my, my comment on the, you know, what we can do, I think what's missing is a social policy and, and politics perspective in yeah. that... I mean, we really, as service providers, people need to understand where their funding comes for their agencies and, you know, learn how to affect government or, you know, find out who's funding what 
pharmaceutical companies in their direct marketing right. to people, you know, go to your doctor and ask them for this. There's a right. lot of money in lobbying mm -hmm. and policy, and that certainly affects how and where we do our work and where the funding comes for that. So I think Ooh. that that's, that's a side that can or cannot be considered political, but it's certainly a big thing about what we can do as far as affecting change or, or policy anyways. Yeah, excellent point. Thank you. I was wondering if there's been any, st I know it just recently happened, but in Portugal that they decriminalize um, uh, uh, mar uh, heroin and other substance use. Right. I wonder if they've done any studies to see any correlations of like drop in HIV or drop mm -hmm. in crime or drop in, in uh, any correlations of, of good outcomes is what I'm asking. In, in Portugal. You know, that's, that's interesting. Tom and I were talking about that, and that was one of the things that we did not include, but we thought that would be incredibly useful in terms of that. We know that in terms of, uh, like, heroin maintenance, you know, that that's really had, like, mixed results in both Switzerland and, and in England and stuff like that. But this isn't, what you're describing is entirely different, and that's taking away the, the, the sort of the illicit nature of it. So far, I think, and Tom, maybe you can speak, I don't know if you can mention it, I think so far what they're seeing is, is improvements in, 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 each of those, in each of those areas that, that, that you mentioned. Yeah, I don't remember what the HIV data looked like specifically, but uh, they did see a dramatic reduction in crime, incarceration, uh, and prosecution costs. They saw improvements in people, uh, the numbers of people accessing treatment. They haven't been doing it long enough to, to uh, look at long -term, longer term treatment outcomes in that regard. But overall, their policy seems to have had, be moving uh, the system in the direction that they wanted it to. Great question. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. So additional comments. What can we use less of? What can we use more of? I know I, I know it's it's a lot of information in a in a relatively brief period of time. It must have been perfect. Thank you, Al. Okay. So. <laughs>